Good afternoon. I'd like to uh, welcome you to uh, the sixth presentation in the noon lecture series of the Lieberthal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies. <clears throat> and I just have a few announcements before we begin. Uh, the next presentation will take place on November 10th, will be given by Meg Rithmeyer, Assistant Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School, speaking on uh, land and the Chinese economy, the politics of economic management. This evening at the Michigan Theater, uh, the China Center will present the opening night of Also Like Life, the fil films of Ho Xiaoxian. Um, and the evening will begin with a reception in the main lobby at 5 p.m., followed by a screening of Dust in the Wind at 6 p.m. in the main theater. And this series is free and open to the public. And we would appreciate it if you could take a, a, t a moment to turn your cell phones off or on silent before the talk begins. Today's presentation will be given by Emily Wilcox, Assistant Professor of Modern Chinese Studies at the University of Michigan. Her current book project, National Movement, Socialist Postcoloniality and the Making of Chinese Dance. And her, she, for this book project, she was the recipient of a 2014-15 American Council of Learned Societies National Fellowship. Her other current projects include a co-edited anthology, Dancing Global East Asia, and a digital humanities collection, Pioneers of Chinese Dance, co-directed with Liang Yufu of the University of Michigan Asia Library. Uh, Emily's past publications appeared in Asian Theater Journal, TDR, China Pearl, and many other venues. Uh, she has a forthcoming article in Positions, Asia Critique, and, and also in the Journal of uh, Asian Studies. She is a board member of the Society for Dance History, and she is president of the Association for Asian Performance. Today, she will be speaking on Rethinking the Socialist Heroine, Feminine Agency in Chinese Dance Dramas of the Late 1950s. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary, for the introduction, and thanks to the Center for Chinese Studies for um, organizing this talk, and thanks to all of you for coming. Um, so, as Mary mentioned, uh, this is part of my manuscript in progress. It's part of chapter four, and um, I'm really excited to be sharing it and getting feedback. So, The Great Leap Forward, a mass movement launched in China in 1958, sought to surge the country forward in areas such as steel and grain production so that it can compete with industrialized nations like Great Britain and the United States. By 1959, China's relations with allies the Soviet Union and India were growing tenuous, giving China's economic and cultural self-sufficiency even greater urgency. Within this context, women's labor increasingly was increasingly emphasized as a resource for national advancement. Rebecca Carl notes, quote, while encouraging women to join production had been a fundamental policy from the beginning of the Maoist period, it was stressed even more in these years, referring to 1958 to 1959. Kimberly Ence Manning has argued that women's labor was central to the agricultural and industrial output of the Great Leap Forward, and as a result, ideals about women shifted during this period. Wang Zheng points out that this was also a time when new discourses about gender politics entered official ideology. Instead of the earlier emphasis on women and helping women overcome social inequalities and differences based on biological reproduction, after 1957, women were now said to be, quote, already equal, unquote, to men in all ways. This emphasis on female labor has often been associated with the emergence of new female gender ideals during the Great Leap Forward. Carl writes, quote, iron women were born as more women began performing non-traditional tasks. In the fields, they drove water buffalo teams and tractors for plowing, traditionally a man's job. In the factories, women moved in droves into management, which combined administrative and labor roles. Women competed with one another and with men for high productivity. Those women who gained distinction in these competitions became nationally known as Iron Women. In scholarship on PRC culture, it has often been argued that this focus on women's labor and the emergence of the Iron Woman ideal led to a general eradication of traditional gender difference, or what has become known as, quote, gender erasure. In other words, women, as represented in visual culture, performance, and film, lacked conventional qualities of femininity and were physically almost indistinguishable from men. Summarizing the scholarship on this topic, performance scholar Rosemary Roberts writes, quote, 
Since the 1990s, research into the construction of gender identity in Maoist China has argued that in the name of equality between the sexes and the proletarianization of the population, Chinese society experienced what is described as, quote, the erasure of gender and sexuality, unquote, as feminine gender was subsumed by the state. Citing film scholar Cui Shuqin, opera scholars Huang Yuju and Li Xianglin, and anthropologist Mayfair Young, Roberts identifies the common claims made about Maoist heroines, namely that they are erased of anything that is feminine, genderless revolutionaries, emptied of female signifiers, in which class replaced gender as the only categorization that mattered. Much of this work points back to work of historian Meng, Meng Yue, who in her landmark 1993 essay, Female Images and the National Myth, wrote, the putative image on the stage actually indicates neither sex. She, in quotes, has neither gender identities, mother, wife, lover, etc., nor body, nor a gender-based perspective, unquote. Such arguments are significant not only in terms of the way they have led us to understand Maoist culture, but also in terms of the ways they have been used to justify the reemergence of conservative gender politics in the post-Mao era. Roberts worries that such claims reassert heterosexual male-centered subject positions, as well as essentialized notions of gender nature and gender roles. And she argues that they are not only theoretically problematic, but also factually wrong. While I find Roberts' argument convincing, I feel that in focusing only on the model works of the Cultural Revolution, it is overly narrow in its scope. After all, the earliest set of model works appeared in the mid-1960s, more than half a decade after the Great Leap Forward and the emergence of the Iron Woman. We know from historical studies of Maoist culture that politics, ideology, and aesthetics all changed dramatically from the late 1950s to the mid-1960s. Nevertheless, while there have been some studies of gender representation in the 1950s, the period remains what Gail Hershatter called in 2005, quote, a curious historical wasteland, unquote. For example, there has been almost no attention to the Maoist heroines constructed in new stage performances that came before the model works of the Cultural Revolution. How were Maoist heroines being performed during the era of the Iron Woman? This is the question I ask in today's talk. To answer this question, I examine the three most popular and best documented narrative dance works, dance dramas of the late 1950s, all of which were also documented as dance films. Magic Lotus Lantern, Dagger Society, and Five Red Clouds. I argue that these works offer portraits of Maoist heroines that do not fit accepted ideas of the Maoist Iron Woman as genderless revolutionaries. Rather, they portray Maoist heroines who embody various forms of feminine agency, that is, political power enacted by figures that in other ways match conventional gender norms. I argue that in their portrayal of male characters, these works enact criticisms of patriarchal hierarchies that limit women's agency. Furthermore, in each of these works, indigenous performance technique serves as a medium for the enactment of these feminist agendas. In these ways, the dance dramas of the Great Leap Forward are exemplars of a visual and embodied discourse of Maoist gender politics that has been largely ignored in previous scholarship. Let me briefly introduce each of these three works. Magic Lotus Lantern premiered in Beijing in April 1957 as a stage work. It is based on a centuries-old folk legend adapted from Chinese indigenous theater. It tells the story of a female immortal, third sacred mother, or San Sheng Mu, who falls in love with a human man, Liu Yanchang, and gives birth to their son, Chen Xiang. Third's elder brother, Arlang Shen, with the help of his assistant, Roaring to Heaven Dog, traps Third in a cave as punishment for breaking what's called the Law of Heaven, Tian Tiao, which prohibits unions between immortals and humans. Finally, under the tutelage of Grand Immortal Pi Li, Chen Xiang trains in the martial arts, fights Arlong Shen, and eventually saves his mother. In the end, the family is happily reunited. The next work, Five Red Clouds premiered in 1959. 
It is a minority themed story set in a tropical island of Hainan in 1943 to 1944 and portrays a successful revolt by a local village uh, of Lee Minority Village um, against local KMT forces, aided by a local branch of the Chinese Communist Party. In this work, um, Ke Ying, a Lee woman, becomes the leader of the revolt after her infant child and husband are brutally murdered by the local KMT leader, whom she eventually kills. Finally, oops, there's the KMT leader, there's her son and infant. Okay. Finally, Dagger Society, also premiered in 1959, is an anti-imperialist work set in Shanghai in 1853. It tells the story of an uprising by local people against the collusion between a local Qing official and Western imperialists, exemplified by the evil American Yan Ma Tai. <laughs> Together, the two are impo importing opium and exploiting the people. This is a scene from the first um, act. In the end, the female fighter, Zhou Xiu Ying, succeeds in killing Yan and leads the group into continued struggle. <clears throat> Each of these works in different ways provides an example of, a pos uh, of positive political agency attributed to a female figure. In Magic Lotus Lantern, Third Sacred Mother enacts political agency by challenging the rules of the immortal realm and the authority of her elder brother. Focused on the issue of marriage choice, the implied parallel between Third Sacred Mother and anti-Confucian May Fourth Women was not lost on contemporary audiences. One critic described Third Sacred Mother as, quote, a typical image of a female within the feudal society raising a flag of resistance against the, the feudal Confucian ethical code. Another critic wrote, Third Sacred Mother, from the beginning to the end, never yields. She who carried out attacks and resistance against the god power, order, achieves the final victory. Although third son Chen Xiang carries out the final act that makes the story's happy ending possible, it is clear from the narrative that Chen's actions are motivated and enabled by third sacred mothers, in a sense forming an extension of her agency. As depicted in this telling, it is third's motherly love that motivates Chen's actions. He gains the conviction to fight after having a dream in which third lovingly embraces him. And the voiceover to the film explains, quote, motherly love stirred Chen Xiang. In, in addition, it is the moral correctness of Third's actions that it's inspire another immortal, Grand Immortal Pili, to train and assist Chen. At this point, the voiceover states, the kind Grand Immortal Pili recognizes the unfairness and decided out of a sense of injustice to help. Thus, it is implied that without Third's moral correctness, Chen would not have had the help from Pili and thus would not have carried out his heroic act. In Five Red Clouds and Dagger Society, the heroine's direct political agency appears through the lead female characters taking over direction of the local rebellion and finally killing the primary villain. Ke Ying, the heroine in Five Red Clouds, is the one who brings liberation to her community, first by taking part in the combat, then by taking over the war drum, a symbolically important vehicle to demonstrate her importance, and finally by seeking out the local CCP official, excuse me, the CCP army, to provide help. When the CCP army arrives to help save the Lee villagers, Ke Ying is shown clearly pointing the way ahead of the CCP troops. Throughout the work, Ke Ying is portrayed as the key subject with whose experiences the viewer identifies, and her sufferings represent the sufferings of the Lee community as a whole. Thus, the final climax of the story occurs when Ke Ying single-handedly drives the KMT commander off the edge of a cliff, representing in her own actions the successful rebellion of the Lee community. Zhou Xiu Ying, the heroine of Dagger Society represents the most agential of the three heroines, since she has never victimized herself and only is shown leading and helping others. From the beginning, Joe is portrayed as indispensable to the rebellion. She provides both the material weapons used in the fight and the training for the group's members. 
Like Ke Ying, Zhou personally enacts the final climactic murder of the story's lead villain, bringing the story to a resolution. The final scene shows Zhou carrying both the group's flag and the symbolic saber, showing that she is the group's indispensable leader. In order to appreciate the gender politics expressed in these works, it is important to compare portrayals of the female characters with those of the male characters and their relationships to one another. In each work, there are multiple leading male characters and only one leading female character. However, the male characters are politically backward and or lack the positive political agency of their female counterparts. As a result, the portrayal of men as villains or failed heroes contributes to the heroine's feminine agency and the discourse of feminist critique expressed in the works overall. Broadly speaking, three types of male characters appear in these productions. First, there are older men with high social status who are principled and powerful, but who protect the patriarch patriarchal hierarchy. Second, there are conniving or untrustworthy male others who lack a social conscience and act immorally, usually out of their own personal interest. Third, there are failed male love interests who hold progressive views but are ineffective in carrying them out. Although the male figures portray more variation and in some cases destructive potential than their female counterparts, there is not one individual who rivals the female leads in their combining of correct ideology and positive political agency. The, the males in the first category are the most complex and I think quite interesting since they represent the powerful and persistent yet inherently flawed nature of the patriarchal system itself. Our Longshen is introduced in the voiceover as quote, holding divine authority over the world of gods and immortals and protector of the feudal orthodoxy. Thus, Ar Lang Shen, though a hateful character, is nevertheless faithful to a larger set of social responsibilities as determined by the system he serves to uphold. Part of the ideological work of Magic Lotus Lantern is to show how traditional forms of social hierarchy produce violence, in this case through Ar Lang Shen's willingness to kill his own nephew and to sentence his sister to a miserable life in prison. Gender inequality is shown to be a pillar of Ar Lang Shen's system since third, sacred mother is punished for the marriage while her husband Liu is let free. R's responsibility to Chen Xiang's birth, or excuse me, R's response to Chen Xiang's birth is contrasted with that of an elderly female character in the work, Liu Yanchang's mother, who accepts the baby and cares for it. An even more complex character um, is immortal Pili, who though portrayed as benevolent also maintains the patriarchal status quo. Rather than using his magic to help Third Sacred Mother escape from the cave directly, he makes her wait for years alone in a cave so that her agency can be carried out through the will of her son. In the end, although Pili promotes male agency, neither his nor Chen Xiang's actions take on the level of political effect. When the narrative, within the narrative logic of the story, it is, Chen's, it is Third's act of rebellion that brought Chen Xiang into existence and invited Pili's help and it is her determination to pursue a romantic and family life on her own terms that comes to fruition in the end. As one critic described the work, Magic Lotus Lantern is an ode to women, wives, and mothers. The elder male characters, Adia and Liu Li Chuan in Five Red Clouds and Dagger Society, respectively, serve intermediate roles between Arlangshan and Pili. Though sympathetic and helpful, they represent a patriarchal system that is being fundamentally challenged. In Five Red Clouds, the character Adia, though fighting on the same side as the Lee villagers and Ke Ying, the lead heroine, fails to recognize Ke's leadership potential until the end, when he sends her to search for the CCP army, an idea that Ke herself had proposed. Earlier in the work, when the Lee community prepared for its battle against the KMT, Adia carried out a ritual of drinking chicken blood, in which he only called on men to participate. In this scene, a minor male character is shown standing on the drumming platform next to Adia, while the other community members, including Ke and the other women, stand below. During the battle, Adia, died, or excuse me, Adia plays the war drum that leads the group on to fight. When Adia is shot, Ke Ying takes over for him. 
However, this is only possible because Adia is literally unconscious and cannot help her. Here, it is not the male patriarch, but Koying herself who makes the decision with the support of another female who stands in front of her to protect her. The audience finally realizes the contrived nature of the traditional system that Adia had upheld, since Koying demonstrates through her vigorous drumming that there is no difference in ability between herself and the previously empowered men. A similar shift takes place in Liu Li Chuan's behavior in Dagger Society. Like Adia, Liu is shown to be the keeper of ritual authority through his use of symbols such as flags, handkerchiefs, and his saber. At the beginning of the work, Liu privileges Pan, the younger male figure in Zhou's romantic interest, as his symbolic successor. When Pan goes off in search of the Taipings, Liu bestows his, his saber to Pan. It is only when Pan is killed and the saber is brought back that Liu himself is fatally wounded that finally he bestows the saber onto Zhou, the, the heroine. Through, through their reluctance to recognize female leadership, these otherwise sympathetic characters represent barriers women face in the world of male authority. In contrast to this first group, which highlights flaws within the social system to which the heroine belongs, male characters in the second group illustrate threats perceived as outside of that system and dangerous to it, setting up a moral contrast that highlights the heroine's positive character. In Magic Lotus Lantern, Arlong Shun's assistant, the dog, is an obvious example of this character type. A contemporary writer described the dog as insidiously fiendish and ingratiatingly complacent toward his master. Lacking moral principles of his own, the dog was willing to do anything to please his master, including act dishonestly. This is made clear during Chen Xiang's birth celebration when dog hides his true identity and takes advantage of the generosity of Third and her husband so that he can sneak into their home to steal the magic lantern. Dog's conniving character is contrasted here with Third's trust and honesty since she opens her home to the party guests and keeps the lantern hanging outside in plain view. In Five Red Clouds, the KMT commander displays even more extreme immorality. Apart from burning the, the Lee's homes, killing them, and forcing them to work like chattel slaves at gunpoint, he also displays racist behaviors that were considered socially unacceptable at the time. At one point, the KMT leader locks Ke Ying and another E villager inside a large cave, excuse me, a large cage, similar to what would be used um, for animals. And he hangs a sign on it that reads, Exhibition Object, um, and then the word Li, in which the word Li is written in an antiquated form that includes the radical for dog or animal. Within the context of the story, which is told from a Li perspective, and again, this is in 1959, after the, those forms of character writing had already gone out of use, this act of dehumanization appears nothing less than barbaric, almost matching in horror the scene in which um, the KMT leader throws Ke Ying's infant into a burning house. Unlike the character Arlong Shen, the KMT commander appears to act not out of principle, but rather from a sense of cruelty that makes Ke's character appear all the more righteous in contrast. The villains in Dagger Society also serve to highlight the heroine Zhou Xiaoying's morality, humanity, and political correctness. The Qing official Wu is portrayed as an opportunistic traitor. He acts mainly to please the American Yan Ma Tai and the other Western imperialists, who in turn provide him literal protection so that they can manipulate the local population through his authority. Wu is introduced scheming with Yen inside a dark Western style church. And Wu appears excited by Yen's idea to use Christianity as a tool to fight the people's rebellion. Once again, deceit is a central feature of this character type and the two prepare a charade in which Yen will masquerade as a clergyman and they both share a laugh over what they perceive to be the duplicity of the common people. Although the Dagger Society members at one point also misrepresent their identity, pretending to be a group of street performers to get past Wu's guards, it is clear that they are in the moral right, since they are responding to violence and exploitation that was enacted earlier in the story against them, and thus they uh, present a perspective of self-protection. The last category of male character, the good but ineffectual love interest, presents the strongest argument for a female agency in these works. This is because unlike in stories of the later Cultural Revolution period, the failures of these young men make them appear obviously weaker and less capable than their female counterparts, to the point that even their deaths are anticlimactic. 
In Magic Lotus Lantern, Liu Yan Chang is portrayed as a sentimental, loyal, and caring, but completely incapable when it comes to physical combat. For this reason, during the scenes of confrontation with Arlongshen, he literally cowers behind Third Sacred Mother, who acts as his protector. In Five Red Clouds, Gong Hu presents the most heroic of the male romantic leads, though his agency still pales in comparison to that of Ke Ying. After being freed from the KMT captivity, Gong manages to bring back a message to Ke that turns out to be instrumental to the Li community's liberation. Also, with the help of Adia, Gong succeeds in freeing Ke from the KMT commander's metal cage. This is the extent, however, of Gong Hu's contribution to the Li revolt overall. His death, halfway through the film, is portrayed as futile, since he appears after the violence has already taken place, and the only thing he succeeds in stabbing in his entire fight scene is a tree trunk. His final death solo, while tragic, serves more as character development for Ke and foreshadowing of the later plot elements, namely the assistance of the CCP troops, than of either his own martyrdom or heroism. In contrast to the death of Hong Changqing in the Cultural Revolution Ballet, Red Detachment of Women, there is no commemoration of Gong's death. Instead, the plot moves quickly onward, focusing on Ke's emotional trajectory. Ultimately, Gong's impact is mainly through the two objects he leaves behind, a knife and a CCP flag, both of which become effective only in Ke Ying's hands. Pan Qixiang, the romantic lead in Dagger Society, is the clearest example of a male hero who is subordinated to and replaced by a female character. Despite being the privileged favorite of the elder male, Liu, Pan has an even less remarkable death than Gong's and a more limited impact overall in the course of the rebellion. Unlike Ke Ying, Zhou Xiuying is already established as a leader before her relationship to Pan is revealed. This is demonstrated in the first scene of the work when Zhou directs the responses to the death of a dock worker, in the second scene when she provides weapons for the rebellion, and later when she is shown training both the male and the female leaders of the rebellion. Joe, Joe's commitment to revolution is not a result of tutelage from a male figure, as is typical in the later works of the Cultural Revolution. Throughout, Joe demonstrates superior skills to Penn, not only in combat, but also in logical reasoning and emotional stability. This can be seen clearly in the scene in which all three, Leo, Pan, and Zhou, visit the imperialist headquarters to demand the return of Wu, who has been captured by them, or excuse me, has been um, taken back from them. He was previously their prisoner. Here, it is Zhou and not Leo or Pan who puts together the clues in the room and realizes that Wu is actually hiding behind a piece of furniture near them. In the same scene, Pan loses control over his emotions and leads to an untimely outburst that threatens the group. This can be compared to the scene in Red Detachment of Women, in which the heroine Wu Qinghua endangers the group by firing early out of her own desire for revenge. <clears throat> Finally, although Pan's exit to seek out the Taipings is heroic, it effectively removes him from the plot which moves on focusing not on his journey, but on Zhou's strict training of the rebel troops. Like Gong Hu in Five Red Clouds, Pan disappears from the plot about halfway through the production, ensuring that the remainder of the action focuses on the female lead. The one time Pan appears in the second half of the work is through a dream sequence that takes place in the mind of Zhou. Furthermore, Pan's death, which occurs completely off screen, is conveyed to the audience through Zhou's learning of the news. As with Five Red Clouds, the narrative focuses not on commemorating Pan's heroism, but instead on Joe's development. After a few moments, Joe takes hold of the bloodstained letter Pan had been carrying. She stands tall while the rest of the group bows down on one knee before her. In contrast to the common perception of Maoist heroines as genderless revolutionaries, the female leads in native dance dramas of the Great Leap Forward embody a kind of feminine agency. That is, they maintain key markers of femininity while at the same time emerging narratively as powerful agents and heroes. So far, I've articulated the heroine's political agency as depicted through the work's plot, including the portrayal of female characters in relationship to their male counterparts. What is it, however, that makes these heroines or their agency specifically feminine? To answer this question requires examining the figures both from the perspective of their social roles as depicted in the work's narratives, 
and of the aesthetic and technical choices demonstrated in their embodied performances of these roles. In other words, because gender is a social construct, answering the question of whether these figures are feminine or not requires examining them in relation to the existing constructions of femininity that were in circulation at the time. One issue that frequently arises in discussions of Maoist gender politics is the issue of motherhood. A common argument about Maoist heroines is that their stories lack references to biological reproduction and that this is an important component of their alleged androgyny. However, two of the heroines in the Great Leap Forward dance dramas discussed here are depicted clearly as mothers, Zhou Xiuying and Ke Ying. Rather than detracting from it, in both cases their status as mothers contributes to their revolutionary agency, since threats to their children intensify their desire for rebellion. Both characters are repeatedly shown caring for and embracing their children, making the status of motherhood a central component of the character's overall image. In terms of the history of Maoist gender politics, it makes sense that discourses about gender and reproduction would be different in these works than in the later works of the Cultural Revolution. And that's because, as mentioned above, recently excuse me, recent scholarship by Kimberly Entz Manning and Wang Zheng suggests that official discourses about gender were in flux at precisely this period during the late 1950s. And this flux dealt specifically re with the relationship between reproduction and gender equality. Official CCP policy prior to and during the Great Leap Forward promoted a position that Manning calls Marxist maternalist, in which special pr protections for women's health were provided based on the idea of reproductive need. For example, women were guaranteed lighter workloads during pregnancy and lactation, according to Manning, as well as work reductions when they had childcare duties. From the Great Leap Forward onward, a variety of factors led to the replacement of Marxist maternalism with a new position on gender politics, what Manning calls revolutionary Maoist. Women's reproductive roles as mothers was downplayed in this new approach, which instead emphasized women's absolute equality with men as the basis for their revolutionary agency. Both the depictions of the heroines as mothers and the highlighting of existing barriers to gender equality in the form of the patriarchal older male characters suggest that Marxist maternalism shaped the gender politics of these Great Leap Forward dance dramas. Another factor that frequently arises in discussions of Maoist gender politics is the issue of clothing style, body type, and self-presentation. So claims about the alleged masculinization or androgyny of Mao era women tend to suggest that Maoist women lacked femininity because they dressed in clothing coded as male socially, had muscular bodies, which was also associated with masculinity, and presented themselves using behaviors and dispositions that were marked conventionally as masculine. Because these factors have played such an important role in discussions of Maoist gender politics, it is interesting to observe that in the three productions discussed here, the heroines perform using costume, movement, and body conventions traditionally associated with the performance of femininity in Chinese visual art and theater. And I'm going to show a, a short clip here from, this is the introduction of Third Sacred Mother's character. So in this sequence, the heroine of Magic Lotus Lantern, um, we see using the costuming elements and movement technique conventionally associated with female characters in indigenous Chinese visual and performance culture. Beaded head ornaments, silk ribbons, curving body lines, swaying waists, the orchid finger hand positions, etc. During the fight scenes, both Third Sacred Mother and Zhou Xiuying, the hero in Dagger Society, use the double swords, um, a prop usually reserved for female characters in indigenous theater. And in these dance dramas, only the female characters use these items.
And this last position here with the, the hand behind the, or excuse me, the foot behind the foot in front called tabu was a position used exclusively for female characters in um, Chinese opera movement. So here we see the double swords. Um, in, the, in the works, these are used only by the female characters. Um, the male characters use different weapons. And I'm going to show you the scene where Zhou Xiaoying is introduced as well. So here she's providing the weapons um, for the rebellion. So again, Zhou Xiaoying's hair, costume, and movement techniques are also drawn from the conventional repertoire, um, coded as feminine in Han folk culture and indigenous theater. Here um, she uses the splayed finger position, um, which throughout the work, that becomes her signature stance, along with the twisted body action and the foot placement diagonally behind the heel, um, with, the, with the heel raised. These are all um, conventional positions that are used exclusively for male or for female character roles in the Chinese coded gender system of theatrical movement repertoires in Jingju, Peking Opera, and Kunshu. The female character's tiny stepping actions in the previous scene also come from that repertoire. Similarly, the costume and styling employed for Ke Ying's character and the other women in Five Red Clouds references existing conventions for femininity. In this case, the calf-length embroidered skirts, head ribbons, and large earrings all bear striking resemblance to images and descriptions of southern minority women found in the Qing Dynasty Miao albums. The sung voiceovers used for Ke Ying's introduction um, also have a distinctly uh, feminine pitch. <coughs> So this is her introductory scene. And the stepping movement that she does here with the feet turned in um, and then raising her leg um, is used later in the work only for the female coded characters. So one theme that runs through my book project as a whole is an exploration of how in the history of Chinese dance, native aesthetics has become a strategic medium for the expression of a variety of progressive political agendas during the Maoist and the post-Mao eras. By using conventional sign systems derived from indigenous theater, folk dance, and martial arts, as well as visual art traditions, the dance dramas of the Great Leap Forward provided models of female political agency that challenged um, patriarchal attitudes and ingrained views about women and provided alternative models of female agency um, as well as feminist gender politics all through the strategic use of the native aesthetics. Um, so in this use of native aesthetics strategically during this period to advance feminist agendas has been something identified in other genres as well. So just to give one example, um, Jin Jiang argues in her book Women Playing Men, an analysis of Shanghai Yue Opera during the same period, that like native dance drama, women's Yue Opera reached a height of fame and popularity at this moment, um, only to be banned during the Cultural Revolution. And that's what happened to the native dance dramas as well. One of the most influential women's Yue opera works of all time uh, emerged during this period, and that was Dream of Red Chamber, um, which premiered as a stage production in 1958 and was made into a color film in 1962, so the same time period as the works I'm looking at. Through a comparison between the novel and the Yue opera production, Jiang argues that women opera artists drastically revised the classic story, omitting many of what she calls male-centered themes and changing it to instead offer what she calls a women's perspective. Such changes included focusing on the romantic relationship between Jia and Lin, raising the status of the female lead and excising themes of polygamy and male same-sex love relationships, as well as changing the character of the male lead himself. This type of adaptation occurred in nearly all Yue opera works, according to Jiang, as Yue opera artists took what had previously been, according to her, um, classic works of literature and techniques from all-male Beijing opera performance, which she calls works created by and for men, and remade them to be, for, be performed by and for women. 
So according to Jiang, uh, form played an important role in making the strategic intervention of Yue opera possible. Through their innovations within an inherited form of indigenous operatic theater that combined singing, movement, and elaborate costuming, Yue opera artists developed their own distinctive style. And this style, she argues, was indispensable to the genre's popular success, as well as to its capacity to tell existing stories from new perspectives. Also, the special po poetics of movement, costuming, and singing that appeared in the Yue opera works, Jiang argues, made them capable of exploring and expressing content not easily dealt with the same way through other performance and film modalities. Although Jiang's argument is at times problematic in its uncritical approach to gender construction, her argument about the capacity of conventional forms to serve feminist agendas is important, especially in the context of Maoist China. Because the representation of gender was highly politicized during this period, and the sexuality of women's bodies was often directly associated with bourgeois sensibilities, as well as moral depravity, traditional or native feminine feminine aesthetics offered a language for expressing a gender difference that could be made compatible with Maoist gender politics. Unlike Jiang, I do not argue that native dance drama offered a feminist gender politics because of the gendered identities of its creators, actors, or audiences. Rather, the parallel I wish to draw with her argument is that in native dance drama, as in women's Yue opera, native performance aesthetics, and in some cases, classic stories, became key resources that facilitated the expression of feminist gender politics. Like the writers of the 1958 um, Yue opera production, Dream of Red Mansions, the directors of Magic Lotus Lantern made significant changes to the classic story upon which this dance drama was based, a popular folk legend known as Splitting the Mountain to Save Mother. As in the Yue opera work, these changes promoted what Jiang would define as a women's perspective. They excised competing love interests, highlighted the importance of the central female, and made the male romantic lead, Liu Yanchang, um, devoted and sentimental. Summarizing these changes, one contemporary critic wrote, the creators refined and concentr oops, refined and concentrated the plot of the original story, taking out Liu's earning of the number one scholar title, for example, and his marrying of Wang Guiying, um, as well as the storyline of Chen Xiang and Qiu Er beating the Qing official, and other storylines. All of these changes served to diminish the capabilities, freedom, and political agency of the leading male characters, Liu and Chen. Meanwhile, details that support Third Sacred Mother's power, such as her status as an immortal and her possession and use of a magic lantern are maintained, despite what might seem um, their likely connection in other contexts to feudal superstition, something that was attacked at the time. Leo's character, previously quite important to the plot, became so secondary in the dance drama that in one of the early versions, he also died halfway through. Contemporary critics consistently complained about the weak portrayal of Liu's character as one of the key features of the work. At the same time, the quality of these works was most often celebrated by contemporary critics, um, specifically in reference to their achievement through so-called native aesthetics. So here's one example of a review of the film production of Magic Lotus Lantern published in People's Daily in 1959, where the, the author points to the rich dance language from traditional Xichu and folk dance um, and its utilization, which the author calls, calls a pure and natural way, as one of the most important qualities of the work. Likewise, a critic reviewing um, a stage version of Five Red Clouds um, lauded the work's relatively strong Minzu Feng Wei, national flavor. Finally, a, crit a critic reviewing the stage production of Dagger Society in 1960 also lauded the work for its effective use of what it called traditional or native music, especially the southern style folk tunes. The composers of Dagger Society, the critic wrote, have changed many people's views toward native music ensembles. They have made people see the true power and appreciate its, its uh, great potential. So reflecting the gender politics of the late 1950s Maoism, dance dramas of the Great Leap Forward era presented powerful female characters that enacted political agency while embodying conventionally feminine images and social roles. And one way they accomplished this was by making strategic use of native aesthetics. By presenting new heroines through expressive modes of indigenous forms, the creators of these works couched their rather radical gender discourse in an artistic mode of cultural nationalism.
This protected them from direct ideological criticism while also providing alternative languages for the expression of gendered physicalities and personal styles. And by using a movement aesthetic that was clearly marked culturally, they paradoxically achieved a wider range of possibility for the expression of gender politics. So I just want to conclude by showing the scene in which Koying takes over the drumming. contrast with her, he's, she's more concerned with Adia's health, whereas she immediately thinks about the need to continue the battle. Um, but at the same time, the other woman is able to help her because she forgot one of the drumsticks. And so then literally the other woman stands to protect her. So thank you very much. So I guess we have like 10, 15 minutes for questions. Yeah. So you're working mostly from the film. During this time period, they did a lot of workshopping and moving from in different directions according to feedback. Mm -hmm. So we have a little bit. So some of the um, reception notes that I took from published um, articles did respond to the early stage production. So in that sense, there's records of the changes that were made. And some people who reviewed the film actually explicitly said, these things were corrected in the film. We're really happy to see that. And so people talked about the changes. And it wasn't something that was you know, covered up in any way. And I've also interviewed um, a lot of the performers who performed in some of these works and talked to them e extensively about how they prepared the roles um, and, and different changes that were made between the different productions. And there's actually also a revival of the stage production. These were the three works that were revived first, um, along with another work about, um, <coughs> interestingly, about Yang Kai Hui. They, they were the first four works revived in 1977 and 78. And there is a recording of a stage production from that revival that had the original cast. Um, so I have that to compare it a little bit to the film as well. Yeah. How many of the actors or uh, you know these workshop things in terms of, of input? What what was the degree uh, to what I mean I'm not talking about the yeah. history, I'm talking about the participation. Kind of yeah, that's a really a question that I've been looking at a lot. So one of the things that's interesting is there's a two-part system where there are a minzu gotan that are specifically gotan song and dance troops that are primarily composed of um, minority performers and artists. And this piece was not made by one of those companies. It was made by a, mili a local military performance group, the Guangdong um, Military Performance Group. So they didn't have a mandate to have uh, minority actors in their troupe. And in terms of the information that I've been able to find about the artists who took part in the creation of the work, um, they were almost all Han. Um, but they do talk about in the, the creation process that they, well, first of all, they, they visited this Five Finger Mountain area as early as 1950 and started to learn about some of the stories. They became intrigued by the story about the, the title, what, what it's referencing is the story of that one day five red clouds will come down and um, we will, our, our exploitation will be over. And so this was apparently a folk story that existed in that period that of course resonated with people. So um, there'd been a lot of interactions between the PLA and people um, of that Lee community area. Um, but when they were actually creating the work, I thought it was interesting that there was a folk dance festival that was held in that area around the same time. And so they went to attend the folk dance festival, which was almost all participants um, from the, the minority villages. And they said that, I mean, it's hard to figure out if this is true or not, but they said that they invited artists who had been part of that folk festival to help with the choreography for the work. And they recognized them, um, not by name though, but they recognized them by location in the description of the creation of the choreography. Um, but I'm still trying to figure out, so one of the things that I find hard is a lot of 
So now um, in the programs, performance programs often list the minority associated with the artist's identity as a way to illustrate minority participation. But at that time, they didn't list the, the identity of the actors, so I have to do biographical work to try to figure out which ones, if any, were minorities themselves. Um, so Jalia, who is one of the main choreographers of this piece, was part of the Eight Route Army and had a long Yan'an tradition, so I'm pretty sure he was Han, but I'm not 100% you know, sure. So I'm still trying to figure that out, too. Yeah. Usually being this uh, what you call gender physicality carries over and is so sort of model work that you can show. Yeah, so that's one question too that I explore in the chapter after this and the gendered physicality definitely does in white haired girl. It's less apparent in um, the red detachment of women. But one thing that I want to look at is um, so the the red detachment of women and the white haired girl were both created on ballet companies. So the, the actors who performed in those works had all previously been performing um, ballet classics like Giselle and Swan Lake, and their bodies were trained to do ballet physicality, which has very strict gender conventions as well. Um, and a lot of the ballet conventions actually are carried over in the, the, um, those works, but they're not conventions that would necessarily be recognized um, by Chinese audience un audiences unfamiliar with ballet. So that's one of the things I'm trying to think about is the way in which they are gendered from a ballet perspective, but those might not read in the same way um, for, for the audiences at that time because ballet wasn't really popularized at the point that those works were created. Um, the other thing I'm interested in looking at is the ways in which Native movement was strategically inserted into those works. Even though they were primarily choreographed using ballet technique, there are certain elements, certain movements that are inserted that come from this Native dance, the constructed Native dance tradition. And I think there's a parallel in terms of um, using specifically native movements that have gender coding associated with them or class coding associated with them. Um, and I'm trying to look at the, whether there are parallels in that or not. Because for example, I've, I've looked at the, um, the, the curriculums that were used in the school in the native dance training um, syllabi. And there are correlations between gender specific movement and um, when native dance movement is used. And so I'm trying to figure out if that's a parallel that it continues into the Great Leap or into the um, Cultural Revolution. Um, but yeah, so I think the, the sort of bigger question behind that is if there is gender difference in the Cultural Revolution works, why are people calling it genderless revolutionaries? And that's one of the issues that Rosemary Roberts takes up. So she actually does a meticulous analysis of white-haired girl, and she concludes that there is gender difference represented in those characters, but that the female characters actually aren't uh, powerful. So she makes a slightly different critique um, that they actually are represented as gendered, and that's part of her critique of the larger narrative. They are gendered, but they're not um, politically agential. Um, because one of the arguments that had been made was that they had to give up gender qualities in order to gain that political participation. Um, so yeah, that, I think that's a larger question for me to think about is to what extent that gender movement remained important in the later periods. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's what, yeah. And, and, it, and I saw a new production of that in China during the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And they had a long scene. Oh, yeah. They had, they had taken, <laughs> they had taken that away, but. Interesting. I mean, it, yeah. Yeah, because the exposure of the legs was really controversial as one of the reasons that ballet was seen as problematic at the time. So it was sort of a compromise to have the shorts. Some of the earlier ballet works had full tights, which was seen as, you know, very Western. Very, It, it fell into those categories of bourgeois sensibilities. Um, but yeah, that's a great set of questions to think about. Yeah. <coughs> sort of a follow-up to the question um, just now. Um, it's interesting that uh, the, the three main texts that you focused on here are all uh, his period pieces. They're all yeah. you know, you know, about the historical uh, uh, past. And the framework that you began your uh, chapter or presentation with is about I am women in quote unquote real life in the 50s and 60s, right? Uh, so I think mm. that there, there is a, a crossing of, uh, of categories here, of, of, uh, of genres, because in this kind of uh, theatrical pieces, that kind of coding uh, comes from a tradition, has a very long practice, uh, and in fact, it is necessary in order for this piece to work. Mm -hmm. but then how this then can be related to or translated into the 
perception or the production of uh, Iron Women in so-called real life is, uh, is, I think, a slightly different question, right? I mean, I think yeah. your, your answer to the previous question began to suggest that uh, that thinking uh, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the necessity to, 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 uh, to shift gears mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in addressing this last question. In other words, if we talk about this theater, it has its own genre, generic conventions and mm -hmm. everything. And that coding probably is, is part of its uh, you know, uh, form. Right. Whereas to talk about I and women and then the erasure of gender in exist, existing or experience uh, you know, of, of, of women during the period, I think then the relevance of this to that category may not be as clear or, or, or evident. And so I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think I, there's two points I want to make. So one is that most of the red, the model operas were also period pieces that took, like the, the Five Red Clouds is taking place during the 40s, right? And that's also the period when those other works took place. So I think temporally, if you make that argument, then the same argument would be, could be held up for the model operas as well, in the sense they weren't taking place in the immediate presence, present. Um, so, but for, in terms of the connection between real life and what's on stage, I think the connection that I was thinking was um, because of the role of women in real life, there was a direct connection to um, political ideology of the period, which um, sought to represent women as being equal to men in terms of their ability to contribute in society. And so I think that because these works were part of the ideological system and they, they rose up through a series of selection processes and eventually became the works that were selected to, per, for example, be performed at the 10 year anniversary celebrations in Beijing, they did have a status as ideological works. And so I think that the connection I see is one in which everyday realities were part of the reasoning or sort of, um, I guess, causal structure that led these ideological shifts to take place, um, which were, it was those shifts also that were reflected in what stage performances were seen as being representative of the larger political agenda and therefore became made into films, for example. They were um, recorded. So um, for me, that, that, that's the connection. But maybe Wang Zhang, you want to add to that? or? Mm. Right. right. So in a very push up in questions that uh, he needs to exclude that post mod more specifically that had to sanction a more era with the marginalization of women and iron boys as a representative or model operas, down to model operas are representative of marginalization of women and erasure, gender erasure. That or disturbing construction rather than a historical reality as viewed as very powerful and illustrated, right? Um, but maybe yeah. make that more clear, you think, that the 1990s perceptions of the Mao era themselves. Yeah, not 1990, actually 1980s. Right. Actually, exactly starting from 1979 when the Xiangsheng Club Party to Iron Gold, to Guya started to bash Hmm. That started with the whole process of condemning the communist authoritarian dictatorship uh, and using gender as a symptomatic issue of how Chinese women were marginalized, how Chinese women's gender was erased, right. and uh, as a way to illustrate the uh, inhumane nature of the authoritarian regime. Right. So Yeah. And it was an intellectual movement in accordance uh, with the regime. Yeah. It's not an intellectual independent critique of Mao. Rather, it's in collaboration with the Communist Party, a 
agenda. Right. So this large movement and maneuver uh, has really been perceived, you know, in, in my term, in your experience, mm -hmm. as a perception that has happened to those of you around. Um, <coughs> so so it, from that perspective, I think your work is very important because all the people who are making those critiques in China in the 1980s are none of them yeah, and that I'm really glad you brought that up because that's part of, I guess, the larger framing of the book project because that actually happened not only in gender but also in the historiography of native dance. So in the 1980s, they start saying, oh, how come we've always been doing ballet? Well, they hadn't always been doing ballet, but that became the narrative. And what? I think she was the basis for the model, the, yes. the heroines of the model yes. opera, but she's never acknowledged in the historiography. Yes. The historiography only mentions yes. Yes. Swan Lake and then Red Detachment, yes. but yes. this was what came, yes. like, yes. yeah. Oh, the movements I was talking about were taken from opera. Yeah. Totally gendered. Yeah. Same. Let's thank Professor 